Hi, hello, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Native Sessions at ADE. My name is Jason Bentley. I am music director of a radio station in Santa Monica, California, called KCRW. Uh, just to begin really quickly with uh, a personal uh, perspective on our guest. Uh, in my first couple years of DJing and obsessively collecting records, house music, uh, reading any publication. At the time, it was a, a magazine called Rock Pool, and I would, I would read the dance column uh, by a guy named Jonathan Kadish and uh, I think David Chang or something. It was a long time ago. Uh, I would go to New Music Seminar in New York in the early 90s and uh, explore the scene and the clubs like the Sound Factory and uh, Shelter and uh, the Limelight as well. Uh, for me, all those records, you know, which actually to this day make up a collection at my home, about 25,000 pieces of vinyl. But uh, at that point, these records were kind of a, a doorway, a gateway to a magic world for me, uh, a world that represented so much uh, unity and energy and something very, very special, which I ended up dedicating my life to <laughs> in many ways. Um, and some of those records were from our guest here this afternoon, um, who at that time was a real hero of mine. So it's a special honor to be here more than 20 years later, uh, sitting with Carrie Chandler. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's well after uh, yesterday. <laughs> uh, how's everyone feeling? Good. How's, how's your... ADE been so far? Oh, it's been great. And um, just just by a coincidence, it was funny. Somebody um, they used to play this stuff of mine on the radio station so much that um, they called it Carrie Chandler. Uh, what is that? K K C yeah K C R W Carrie Chandler Radio Works. <laughs> so, I was like, oh my god. But thank you for that that introduction. That was really nice. Absolutely. Right. You know, I think the probably the first record that. Um, really became an instant uh, classic for me is the Atmosphere EP oh, thank you. and track one. Um, and that came out on Shelter Records. This is in 1993. Were you making that record for the club, you know, to be played in the, in the club, Shelter? Fun well, funny enough, I did Shelter actually in the Shelter. I took all my machines and EQ'd Shelter there and then I um I went back and just you know I took all the settings and the EQs and just put it to tape but as far as track one that was actually supposed to go to uh, Sybil Jeffries originally she was actually supposed to put a vocal to it and um, Jerome Sydney was one of the head A&Rs over at Atlantic and we were working on this stuff and he says oh my god this is this this needs to be out like now I want to do some kind of bootleg thing of it in Japan and he, he took four tracks, he, he named them, um, the original project was actually called 007, and he named it one, two, three, and four, original, that was it. And he put it on some weird white label in Japan. Then it came back in reverse, and um, yeah, then Freddie Sennon got it on Shelter. So it came out in Japan before it was on Shelter yeah. Records in 93? Yeah, it was a, maybe, I think he did like some limited pressing, maybe 500 copies of this that that thing on white label with some paper saying 007, one, two, three, and four. I was always curious why it was so anonymous, why they, where there weren't names associated with it, because I never really knew how to refer to it because track one was actually on the B side and it was just confusing. Yeah, like it, it just climax one, climax two, track one, track two. It, it's, I don't know, that's Jerome's logic. <laughs> I never really came up with a name for it because it was actually supposed to be a song. And you know, it really surprised me, too, when it came back the way it did. Uh, anyone in the room know the track that we're, we're talking about? Track one on the Atmosphere EP? Oh, okay, cool. cool. <laughs> Gav. <laughs> well, I, th I think, you know, the melodic uh, parts are, are very memorable. But I think the thing that really hit me was the bass. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's so uh, defined in a range. I mean, it, it's even hard to appreciate outside of a club system, you know, because that's really where you're meant to hear that. 
Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> uh, what were you What were you producing with at that time? Oh, machines or just in general? Um, I had a well. First thing, and I, I remember going to go hear Tony Humphreys at Zanzibar once, and same thing. It was just like I, I was so fascinated with some of the stuff he was playing, and then I heard him at Red Zone, and I was doing a residency there back and forth, and I just you know I was you know warm up DJ. And he played this one track, and I couldn't remember what it was called. Something I think it was by Tyree Cooper, and that's the first time I heard like a proper 909 sound. Like it was just like that was like, where did that bass drum come? What is that? What machine is that? Because I was so obsessed at the time with 808s and all these Yamaha drum machines. But when I heard that, I was like, I have to figure out what that is. I gotta go figure out what machine that is. And it was just like you had to. You couldn't just go on the internet and go, oh, that's just that thing and get a sample or whatever it was, because it was so rudimentary, all the, even all the sampling technology. I think I had a Mirage or something. It was back in the 80s. And I think my first real sampler I got was a Roland S50. And then this guy just happened to come into the studio, and he had a 909 with him, because I was actually a, one of these engineer guys that, you know, rent the studio time out, and I was just, you know, the engineer. And he brought it in, and he had an 808 and a 909. And I said, Oh my God, this is that thing, that machine. That's, I'll finally get to see what this is. So I, I sat and I put it all the tape and I sampled the living crap out of this machine. And I was just like, well, what else can I do with this? Can I extend this? Can I put this in the sampler? Can I do that? So I was really, really obsessed with it. But at the time, the guy didn't have any money. So he said, I will, this is true. And I, I'm like, to this day, he's probably kicking himself in the head. He says, if you do a session with me, I will give you my 808. And, you know, I'll, I'll just take my 909. I said, I just ran upstairs. I said, we, we're going to get an 808. Let's, you know, this guy wants to do a session just to do a track. And, you know, I'm like, that was that. So, but the thing is, the, the 808 didn't have any MIDI on it. It just had, like, DIN, and you had to do all of these triggers and things. And I couldn't sync it to anything. So, at the time, there was a company called um, Studio Electronics. And... They didn't actually make keyboards and all the stuff then. They did modifications. And the first thing I said was, well, you know, it, it was all in the back of these weird magazines. I can't even remember the name of the magazine. But I saw that they did modifications for machines. So I said, okay, well, yeah, this is it. I'll just send it to these guys. And they did modifications and put MIDI on it and all this extra stuff. And I had to make stin the bass and all these things and, you know, change the claps and just pitch everything extended. And they did the MIDI on it. And so when they sent it back to me, I was like, whoa, this is, this is crazy. I mean, I've tuned things that I've, I couldn't do before on this, and it was dropping long. Like the bass line would be, it would, the bass drum would just, just go boom, as long as I want it, and it would decay. And I was like, this is exactly what I wanted. But then when I went across the triggers for the keys, because it was there, and that's how we were programming, just putting them in a the sequencer and just, oh, wait. So now the clap and the, and the, the cowbell we're on the same channel for the MIDI key. And I was like, this is, okay, something's wrong here. So I called them back, and they said, are you good with a soldering iron? And I said, oh, I'm okay with one, yeah, you know. <laughs> so there began my obsession with trying to figure out some of these machines. So I, I flipped it over, and I saw what they did with it and how they changed the resistance between all of these things. Now, this is a long, winding story. This is why I'm going back to why and why my machine sounds the way it does. I went back and I saw how they did the 808. And I said, oh, okay, I see. They changed the resistance on this. They changed this. This is for the pitch. And I'm, I'm looking at all the numbers. And then I actually got a, the schematic for the inside of this machine. And I said, oh, this isn't that hard to do. I can do this. This is just changing resistance. And I can do that. Just put this pot on there. And I saw the MIDI card thing they stuck on it. So then I got really lucky. And there was a place in New York called Rolled Music, which is funny enough, that's where I met Dennis Ferrer. And they had a 909 there. And I bought the 909 immediately. Like, I was just like, I couldn't believe I was even looking at it. And it was cheap. It was like, I must have paid 450 for this thing. It's like, you can't get a 909 for 450 now, unless you get like an R8 or something, but that's not the same. But I, I said the same thing to myself. I, this thing works that way with the 808. It must work the same way with this 909. So immediately, 
I got my screwdriver out, my, my soldering iron, I looked at all the parts again, and I said, I'm changing this. I'm changing this bass drum, I'm changing the snare, I'm changing all, everything I can change that wasn't sampled in this machine, anything that was analog, I was changing it. And that's what happened, and that's where I kind of got my sound from, and I started modifying all my machines after that. Anything I can change, or find some odd program to reprogram something, I would change, and I would make it even heavier, or, or darker, or deeper, or change frequencies and tones, and I was changing op amps and ICs, like, that, that was just me. I was a hacker, originally. I was a, <laughs> a yeah. programmer, and all, all these things fascinated me. Well, yeah, you you know, listening to you, I, I didn't fully realize how much uh, of, of an engineer you are, you know, a sound engineer. And then uh, just talking with you uh, ahead of, of this panel, um, we were talking about tuning sound systems. Yeah. And so were you also very interested in going to the venues and hearing exactly how those records would play? Oh, completely. It sounds, that's the fun part about all this stuff. When you make records, they sound completely different in a club than they would sound on some monitors. It's a different feel. You can actually feel the, the, the textures and the music and, and what the drivers are putting back out. It's like, that was, I guess I'll, I'll see something, show you something. Just so, I, I wish I could put this on a monitor to show you guys. But I, my obsession are monitors. They, they're, they're, there's so many ways to, um, do things, but the first thing that you have to do is make sure that your monitoring is correct. Because if you don't monitor your system, like what you're coming out, you can hear something in your, in your house and you like, oh, this is banging. You get it into somebody's car or, or something like that. I have sets and sets of monitors, but I have a club system in my house. It's a Vertec. And this is what I use to monitor back on so I can hear what it sounds like if it's in a club. But um, yeah, it's just immediately like, well, here's the rest of it some of the other gear, and then, oh, that helps too, I have a Neve. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is my, where I work out of, right there. That's my main workstation. So when you, you know, when you go out to play, mm -hmm. you know, is, is soundtrack like a, a next level thing for oh, you? Oh, forget or? it, I have to. <laughs> uh, the, the first thing I would say to any DJ is that it's, you make it your business if you're professional at what you're doing, you make sure that the sound is right. Because you never want to go into a club and have, have something that you think is going to work. I mean, like especially like a CDJ or something. And like then uh, it's infamous for this. Networks. The network's cables will break or some kind of you know, thing isn't working with their, um, their hub or their router. I always bring backups for my backups for my backups for my backups. That's the first thing I do. I don't have like just one stick and it's all networked in and I'm trying to like, oh, ah, oh man, what? I have a stick, I have sticks and sticks and sticks of the same exact thing. So when I go into one, it's into the next one and then the next one, I, I, always, always. That's the first thing I end up doing. If something's wrong, I make sure, I check every single way that that thing is. I update the firmware and each CDJ I get in front of, I, it's an obsession, but for me, it's like I don't want to be any place that, that. My other thing is I don't want to be any place where I can't understand something. I I I make it my business to to buy every mixer that comes out ahead of time, because I never want to walk in front of something and go, I don't know how to mix on this. That's 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 to me, it's not professional. You should know. I don't want to walk in front of an Allen and Heath and not know what, how that thing works. Versus a Pioneer, versus any other mixer for that matter. Any well, rotary, I want to know how a URI works. I want to know how a, a, anything that's in front of me, even turntables. I spend time setting up turntables. You know, that's very important. My cartridges, I have two sets. I have ellipti elliptical cartridges and I have spherical cartridges. Elliptical sounds better playing back. It will like eat your record alive if you spin it back. But it sounds better. It tracks better. It's cleaner because it's made for that. For using time code, I use my spherical because I'm always back queuing. And same thing, it's like a lot of people, they just put the cartridge in, they don't ever really check how the weighting is, and you know, you're gonna get feedback and all these other things. That, to me, is really, really important. So if you're going for sound check, you absolutely have to do that. Well, let me ask you then, you know, as someone who will play uh, anywhere, uh, me, personally, I'll play in back of a taco truck on La Brea and Pico. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best sound system you've ever played on? 
anything Richard Long. <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. We we were spoiled with sound back home, and Richard Long was like pretty much the god of sound back then. And that's where I get my my. We were blessed in New York to have every major club have a Richard Long sound system. So, so this is Shelter, this yeah, is Zanzibar. Zanzibar, Shelter, ADA, uh, Sound Factory, Sound Factory, Bars, Yellow, you name it. It was Richard Long or some kind of rendition of Richard Long systems. And it were always the same thing, Gauss drivers, JBL drivers, Bertha subs, you know, five-way systems, you know, and and you had to know or it was our job to know at the time I had a punch card when I was a you know like a, a resident, not at shelter like this way, like the punch card, but when I was at eighty eight I had a punch card, I had to know lighting, I had to know uh the system, I had to know the amps very, very you know intimately if anything was wrong or blown out, it was my responsibility because whoever else was coming in to d j I had to make sure everything was right. You know, it was that system was was amazing. So for something to be wrong with it, I mean, I'm the same way. It's just like I remember going into to Ministry of Sound once, and I know that system really well. And I'm so obsessed with sound, I, I can just put something on it, and I can listen and go, these aren't even the same drivers that were in this this club before. And just so happens one night we were doing um I think it was um a Soul Heaven party, and I I put my first record on it, and I'm like. Something's seriously wrong with the system. This isn't the same. Something's wrong here. They had six stacks that were around the room. I went to each stack, and I made a map of each driver that was blown out of the system. Like, one, this is wrong. This is gone. This is. And the guy told me the night before there was a, a drum and bass party. And they blew, blew. They didn't know. No one checked the system. Maintenance is very important. So they blew out half the system. So now we have a party to do. There's no extra drivers because I would be the first one there with a drill going, let me take all of these out and put new ones in. They didn't have backups for any of this stuff. And that was the first thing. We always had extra drivers for everything. And that's, that's how I was spoiled with doing that. But what ended up happening was, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, I went through each stack and tried to EQ the entire room to make it match back what it was before. It's almost impossible. End up doing it, but what happened was after that night, they brought it to the attention of the club. What happened? They closed down Ministry of Sound and put a whole new system in after that. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Chaos <laughs> is uh, your middle name. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it really sounds like your middle name should be, you know, the scientist or, you know. Well, no, I, I got teased a lot of that for real <laughs> in school. Especially being a kid, I was like, they always called me the mad scientist. <laughs> well, like, yeah. you know, it doesn't sound like you, um, that chaos agrees with you. Well, I'm a, I'm a very spiritual person. And, and I've, not I've noticed something that, that kind of happens every year. And everybody might have this for, the, for their life, sometime in their life, where... You notice around a certain time of year that strange things happen. And my my thing was, I've noticed June was always a bit odd for me. So chaos for me was chaos on June 23rd. They write it in reverse in Europe, like the date and the, the, the thing are back. Because so everybody used to ask me, was that time of a record or is it my birthday or something? No, it's, it's, I always thought June 23rd was chaotic. And I'll, I'll give you a few reasons why. One year, you know, it's even like me staying in the house, bad things always would happen. I, w I figured one year, okay, well, if I don't leave the house, nothing can happen. That same year, my grandmother dies on June 23rd. My uncle dies the day after, June 24th. My cousin, the day after that, June 25th. House caught on fire one year. I had a tax problem like you wouldn't believe one year. They just went and levied my thing because I was invincible when I was a kid. No one told me about tax um same thing i mean just I, I can tell you like even this year weirdest thing in the world it's like new jersey with tornadoes that, that doesn't happen that's like kansas or, or something june 23rd at, at honest to god 623 i had a, a thing in my phone i could show everybody this a tornado comes through rips out 
most of my neighborhood, takes the power out for days, tore trees up out of my yard. And like we were just there like for the week, just no power, looking at each other like, what just happened? And, and it's just, I just kept noticing every year there would be something really, really strange. I mean, you can Google back and just see what I'm saying in New Jersey for June 23rd. And I was just like, I can't, again? I, I thought I got away with it again. Like, oh, nothing's going to happen this year. Great, a nice sunny day. Out of nowhere, just this, the cloud got, you know, the scout got gray and dark. And it was, the, the storm lasted all of like 20 minutes and killed everybody's power. Trees, everything gone. It was knocked out houses. I mean, roofs off of places. And I was just like, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is just, yeah. So that, yeah. that's where chaos comes from. And I just shortened the June 23rd out of it. The, uh, the club scene, the underground, you know, can be a very chaotic environment. But it, it sounds like you try to give order. Uh, order from chaos. You give order to that environment and um, have people really have the best experience uh, possible <laughs> in that in that chaos. Um, I want to talk about Madhouse real quick. Okay. Um, just also going back to my earliest uh, days, uh, appreciating your work, um, and this was your label. Thank you. Um, and also a compilation, a basement, a red light, and a feeling, which was great. There weren't a whole lot of compilations out those days, and, and you put out one. And, and one track in particular that stayed with me was... Uh, Dreamer G. <laughs> I got that I got feeling. That feeling yeah. Now, I think the reason why is that the performance, the vocal performance is so raw. It's like blues. You know, it's like blues meets house music. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we've, we've touched on the, the technical side for you and engineering and, and you know, you're, you're in the back of the gear and you're turning things upside down. But the music side, um, you know, and these are things that have stayed with people. And, you know, we're, we're thousands of miles away and, and barely know each other. But through the music, we have a relationship and a connection. And so um, talk about that side of what you do, you know, making timeless music as a, as a musician. Okay. I would honestly say that this is <laughs> it's an odd story. And I, and I, I can't believe I'm going to actually explain this. I hope I explain it right. And I never really thought I could do house music. I know that sounds strange because I'm not doing it so much now. I used to do a lot of hip-hop stuff earlier on doing production. And I was back in the 80s, 80, 88, 89. And, and as I said, my obsession was I, I worked at a place called Club 88, which was around the corner from Club Zanzibar. And then when I, th I would just leave from there uh, maybe four or five o'clock in the morning, my, my club would close and we'd just listen to Tony till the sun came up. And that was my thing. I'd just wait and I'd, I'd you know, take my little scrap change or whatever in my records and leave him in the booth, give Tony a hug and just take the bus back home or, or, or whatever. I used all my money for getting records and gear and whatever. I just, you know, some measly little punch the time card in, punch the time card out, check. Being a resident at a club, it was just the weirdest thing. And then that weekend, I would go to moving records and just go buy records. And I would spend all my time just, just being an intern at, at a studio and listening. And I, and I had the, thank God, I had the privilege of growing up with Pick Connolly, which is from Surface, and, and Cool and the Gang, which is Mikhail Muhammad, which was one of the writers, and, and Khalis Bayan. My, they were my dad's friends because my dad's actually a DJ, and I, I actually got to go in to watch how they made records, and that that's where I was like, I, you know, we were used to this little two-channel mixer, like a clubman one-on-one, -on -one. and that's our mixer. You know, we we're just DJing with this thing at the club in some 1800s, and I was just like, when I saw this thing, it was like eight foot long, all these lights, and I'm watching it, and like, what is that? That's what I want to do. That that looks amazing. I want to know what that is. And I just, I like trying to figure out things I don't know. So what got me into house or just making house music and, and why I, I started doing it was because I had this girlfriend named Tracy. And she was really into to house music and, and just, she was obsessed with it. And she would always go to Zanzibar. And it was this was our third anniversary, and I was going to marry this girl. And 
on her birthday, her birthday was September the 1st, our anniversary, another weird day, was September the 11th, and my birthday was September 28th. And I said, okay, well, this year, you know, we're going to get married. Good. I'm happy. I was just, I think I just turned 17, 18. I was like, yeah, this is it. This is my life. I love my life. This is this girl. Done. And on her birthday, she went to Zanzibar, and I was going to meet up with her over there. And she had this this really creepy ex-boyfriend who did not like the idea that we were together. Because you know, I've known her before high school. And he just did not like the idea of not being without her or, or around her or whatever. So he took her outside. And this is really hard for me to say because I'm really kind of tearing up about this. He took her outside, raped her, uh, beat her in the head with a, a rock, smashed her head open and dragged her behind the bushes and left her there for dead. And it, it affected my life completely. Like it really just took me through a loop. And I just, I, I was the same after that. I got really quiet. I became very introvert. And I stayed in the studio and I just, I just really, really had to find a way to bring myself back to normal. I had to get a lot of these things off of my mind. And music, I, I kind of thought would do it. And I kept saying to myself, well, she loved house music. She loved house music. I, I, maybe I should try something. And the first record I did was called Get It Off, which is short for Get It Off of My Mind. And every part of that record, I used a sound that made sense to me, like the, the pads on it. It, it, was, it was something that, that felt very deeply to me, the heart and harmonics. The, the ripping sound that comes across the record, it just, there's a part in the record where it just goes, Rah! That's how my life felt. Someone took her away from me. It just changed my complete groove, changed everything about what, what I felt. There's a part in the song where it goes, you are so vicious in the song. I'm talking to the guy that killed her. And, and then I'm saying to myself, I got to get it off, get it off my mind, set it loose. And I found myself making every record in my life that way, like it, it, I don't go into the studio and consciously say, I'm going to make a record and it's going to make money, it's going to be dope. These, this is the first time I found a way to make an outlet for my voice. So every record that I've ever made from then till now, there's a real story behind it. There's a reason behind every single record I've made. I can't just go in, maybe remixes I can go in and try. But if I write something, Every single record, there's a reason behind every single one of them. I just, I, that's the only way I can write. And that's, that's why I'm hoping people can relate to what I do. And that's why. And, you know, this might be a really difficult question con considering what we just heard. But um, do you have a, one record that you are proudest of for whatever reason, whether it's musical or engineering or what it represented in terms of your career? I, I hate to say this, but they're, they're all been kind of therapeutic, so I'm, I'm very happy to get them all off of my, my chest and my heart. But I've got to say the, the one that, that I really, the, the most, one of the most heartfelt ones I can say, I can't say which one I like in particular the best, but the one I made for my daughter, it's a song called For My Daughter. My daughter is actually named after me. Her name is Carrie as well. And... Um, it was just a typical day of a, a, a dad and a three-year-old. And I travel so much that, that I barely get to see my children. And I have two children. She's 19 now. And um, I, I just thought if something would happen to me, I wanted to leave her a message telling her, you know, just how much I love my, you know, loved her. And I wanted to, to kind of leave it as a, as a memoir because things were going so well. I was traveling so much, and she would always just like, "Well, when are we gonna have some more fun again, Dad? You know, are we gonna, you know, we're gonna go to the park again, and we're gonna go ride bikes, and you know, we're gonna watch movies, and you know." And to me, it's just like I took a, a typical day. Same thing with that track. A three-year-old. If, if anyone has a three-year-old or, or has a niece or nephew, they know a three-year-old is running around the house, like you're going crazy, you know. So my first thought was, okay, the baseline has to run around too. So I did a walking bass line. So it's like doing, 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 you know, just running. Same kind of thing. And I thought if I sing this song, I have to sing it 
almost like tears in, in my heart because that's what it is. That's like I love my daughter. So I want to I want to get the the point across and emotional and and create some kind of pattern because my life was in some kind of not like you know it wasn't a typical dad you know I'm going away every time and I come back and I get the warmest hugs and oh I missed you dad and you know I'm watching her grow and I never, always had this thought where and, and this happened recently and it bothered me but <laughs> you know they know they know what I do now which um and this is just a typical movie thing where. Your kid is in a play, and it's like chairs like this. And there's a chair for dad. He's not there. And they're looking out in the audience going, oh, well, mommy's here. Dad's not here. You know, and that, that always bothered me You know, to this day. It's like if, like landmarks. I mean, this is really funny. My daughter asked me recently. She says, when is Christmas? I said, Christmas? I said, what do you mean? She said, she said well, what day is Christmas? I said, what do you mean? I said, it's, you know, it's December 25th. She says, no, no, I mean, what, is it really December 25th? I said, why, what do you mean? I have this thing where I move Christmas because it's Boxing Day somewhere else and I always have to fly out. So <laughs> it could be December 24th, maybe December 23rd. So they get Christmas early. <laughs> <laughs> so do you yeah. feel bad about it? You know? No, because they're, they're, they're wonderful kids and they, they you know, spoiled rotten. Because do I get they, to do it. Do they support your, oh, your yeah. career? Well, this is the fun part. My daughter is now a musician. <laughs> mm -hmm. So she, she gets it. She's, you know, she had a taste of the stage and she plays guitar and, you know, she's got a rock band. Will she be featured on any of your tracks? You know what the funny thing is? She, she's, she's, in, she's like a hippie. <laughs> she likes rock. She likes um, Led Zeppelin and, and, and um, Janis Joplin and all these, you know, kind of things. And, Pink Floyd and Beatles and that's cool. You know, I actually sort of take. I think this the most fun I, I had with her recently. We went to go see um, what is his name? One of my heroes actually, Alan Parsons. So we went to go see Alan Parsons Project live, <laughs> and uh, she was just like, "Oh, this is the dude that." And I was like, "Yeah, that's him." <laughs> and then a couple of weeks after that, we went to go see the Beatles. Well, not the Beatles, Paul McCartney, and he did all the Beatles songs, and she had her uh, guitar lele with her. So she's out like maybe a few rows back and holding her guitar lele up and he starts playing stuff and she's playing it. He, she's, play, you know, she's in the audience playing the same thing. So I was just like, you know, that was, that was it for me. I never saw my daughter so emotional. But that's, that's one of these bonds that we all kind of share. We all, all, all love music. And to, for me to be, a, be a, a, a DJ, I try to be as open-minded to all sorts of music. I listen to everything. Where, what's your workspace to write? And are you writing currently? Yeah. <laughs> well, what's just funny, I, I actually just moved, so I have another spot. And I always wanted everything in front of me, hands reach, like like right, right there, so I can just go wheel around the room and have it in front of me. So everything is, is arm's length. I never, I used to have a bunch of racks, and I got to go down there and go plug something in. And everything now is patch base, touch screens. I have four sets of monitors. I have like servers. Things connect to another room. I have another room that's a virtual room. It looks like a, a theater, so kind of like this room. And so again, I'm with some kind of. It, it, it reminds me of like Star Trek or something. And there's one controller, and I'm voice commanding everything with this this head that's set on, with this thing called Dragon Dictate. And I made another program that actually opens up plugins and moves things. So I'll go Crystal open, and it'll go. Boop. And this thing will pop up and it'll say, carry it. And then I'll just, <laughs> I'll start going, okay, native instruments, let me go complete control. Good, complete control, plug in. And it'll ask me and I'll tell it. And I'll say, well, I need a um, battery, battery four, load, done. You know, and at the same time, there's a, there's a keyboard, so it'll actually listen to me at the same time. I'll hit the button and, I'll, and it'll, I, it doesn't interact until I hit the keyboard, so. I, I had this notion one day. I said, well, because I'm into AI, a lot of AI, and, and, and I don't know if you guys know, I build lasers, <laughs> and, and I do holograms and all these crazy things. I, 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 I'm, I'm a mad scientist, really. So I had this thought, and for years, me and my friend Stephen Thomas, one of my best friends as we were growing up, he now works, if I kept his path, he works now at the Pentagon doing their computer systems. And... We were like this, and I and actually we were like you know these kid hackers in our school, and 
I, same thing. I kind of taught him programming languages, and I learned different languages. And you know, and, and that was just our obsession. We we were we were crazy kids. So my thought was, I want to do artificial intelligence. So now I have these machines, and I thought it would be interesting to hear the conversation. So now I have one machine talking to another machine, and I'm just watching how they can. I mean, they can just plug them in; they can do it that way. But I wanted to hear the conversation. So I put an input in and make one would say one thing. They were fighting. They were actually fighting. It was like they, they hated each other after a while. It's like, who are you? Why do you want to know? I don't care about that. Who, what language are you? I, you know, it was the craziest thing. I was like, this is cool. So then I, then I left it on overnight just to see because they develop. It, it remembers functions and commands and things. So I came back and they were both off. I was just like, what well, What happened? They canceled each other out. <laughs> it's like, I guess they, 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 they didn't want to talk to each other. Well, they just canceled each other out. Just go about your business. I don't care. So, yeah. What's the piece of gear or instrument that you could not do without? Wow. Again, I got to say my 909. That, that to me, I think that got me. It, it's kind of one of my signature sounds. My 909. I think that the kick drum on that thing is just, it's just, it, the minute you go, oh, that must be Kerry. <laughs> well, from what you were describing yeah. earlier from, you know, soldering, <laughs> he's in a soldering iron and reworking um, to now, mm -hmm. do you think um, all of the options with software and technology has made your life Better, worse, or are things just about the same in terms of how you oh, how it's you much easier things? now. I don't have to recall anything on my desk. That's the first thing. That was that was always it. I mean, I don't if anybody is back in the day from using tape machines and and bunch of uh, I don't know what you would call it recall strip tapes and everything across the desk. And when you have a lot of channels to mix, I mean, they're hanging on the wall. Like, oh, what mix was this? This is. I don't know, Fela Kuti's thing, and then, oh, this is Tin City's thing, and oh, this is Bon Wah's mix now. And then if you, somebody has to, to go back and tell you, okay, well, you have to remix this thing again and upload, you know, I got to go back, dig through the tape again, calibrate the tape machine, make sure all the levels are where they are, go back and change each channel for the same EQ to get it back, and then that's how it was. Now I can just go, oh, what's fine? What makes you want? You don't even have to listen to it anymore. You can just render it. But, but don't you think yeah. that there's something valuable to having that education that well, you're describing of I, actually cutting tape? You know what the funny thing is? I, I used to think that too. I honestly did. I really did. Until my, my at the time, he's 12 now, my 10-year-old comes up to me with his iPad. And he goes, check this out. And he's got a K-oscillator, funny enough. And um, and his iPad. So I said, okay, well, let me let me see what you're doing. I thought it was cute. I was like, oh, this is cool. And he's got hundreds of songs. And and I'm like, okay, well, here's here's the fun part with me and my son. My son is now a programmer, and he does JavaScript and all these other things, and he makes games and he does same thing. He's kind of picked up where I left off, and I go up to see him. He has a workstation, and he's I, I'm so proud of him. He um. He went to Princeton this year to to finish JavaScript because this company, I don't know what it was called, real time something, real real, so whatever this company was. They, my son was a beta tester. He never told me this. He was a beta tester for this company, and he became one of the programmers at at ten years old. And I just went up to him. I was like, "Well, what is this? What are you? What is going on here?" He he has his name on programs now. He makes apps. And he sends them in to iTunes. So his thing was, he's making games up now, and he has this iPad, and he's using Chaosolator. And, and he's, he has names for everyone. Oh, this is the boss level. This is this level. This is this. This is this. And I'm like, OK, well, what do you mean? What's going on here? And I, I just, he says, check this track out. I, he just gave me his headphones, hit the play button. I'm looking at him I'm like, at the time, we were at a diner with my, my best friend, Dennis Ferrer. And we're just, I'm sitting there, I'm like, and I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at Dennis, I'm looking at him, and I, and I said, okay, wait, give me a second. I'm going to throw up. You just ate. Give me a second. I said, Dennis, check this out. 
Just just put this on. And and Dennis just sits there and he's like, Hey. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I said, and I just said, he says, What is this? Is this one of yours? I said, No. I said, This is Max's. And he says, No way. I said, I'm serious. And so we're going through his tracks now, because I I've never really thought of here like you gotta be joking. So I'm like, What? Oh, damn. I like that sound. What is that? I need that. Where'd you get the what? You know, so I'm going through myself, ready to like, hey, we need the remake. So that 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 was my thing. I was just like, I was blown away by that. So I honestly, yeah, I was like, and it, when a ten year old can come up with everything I did, nine oh nines, eight oh eights, and all these other sounds that it took me forever to sit and program. Yeah, you know, re recall sheets, and he can just sit there at a at a diner, having breakfast, chewing a sausage, and going. Yeah. So, okay, so maybe cutting tape isn't that yeah. important. No. no. <laughs> like father, like son, apparently, huh? No, I mean, I, I love the warmth of tape, but I mean, there's a lot of things now that emulate it really well. And I, I love UAD stuff. The same thing, Native Instruments stuff. I'm not plugging it because I'm at Native Instruments, but there's a lot of Native Instruments stuff I use, especially, um, and I hate to say this, I'll probably get in trouble for this. I like battery for more than I, I actually play with Machina. And I even program stuff for Machina, so, you know, for them. But I, I, I prefer sequencing with my program and then using battery. Even though all the sounds are in there and I can go this way, but it always felt to me like, if I want to do a groove, I mean, I have Machina, iMachina in my pocket and I can take it with me and I can go, oh, and then dump it into that one and then I do it that way. But if I actually start working on a program first, then it's just straight into the machine. And I just like hack the sounds in. What do you What do you make of uh, stems? Stem. See, that's the other fun part. There, it's like multi tracks, and you can get to remix everything on the fly. I think that's that's the most fun. When I when I found out you could do that, I immediately got the program, so I can take all my multi tracks and dump them in. So if I want to remix Rain live or Track One live or anything like that. I can just put them all in the sequence. I can make longer breakdowns. I can loop them. I can affect individual parts. I can do things that I can do right now on the fly and mix them in. I can change bass lines and put them in with another bass line. I can take parts of that and, and adjust levels. I can take vocals out and put other things in. And that, that to me is like, it's like having a master mix on the fly immediately. It's like, bow, bang, 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 bang. Are, you, are you planning on releasing any of your tracks in stems format? Are yeah. you comfortable making that available to the public? Oh, yeah, the public? No, I am now, because I mean, everybody kind of samples it anyway, so I might as well. <laughs> yeah. But it does seem like you put a lot of thought into a mix, you know, a, a cohesive, finished yeah. record. You yeah, know, but it, I mean, it's kind of fun. I think, I think see, this is the, the fun part. I, uh, as I'm doing mixes, I mean, I just, I get, a lot of multi tracks and when I when I do mixes. So I think for the next generation coming in, they can actually hear all the parts and how it was put together. So they'll learn how to make the music themselves. And that's the thing. It's like even when before I left I ended up doing a mix for uh, Paolo Nutini. I did one for Disclosure right before I left as well. There's one for Citizen. There's one for Pop Off and then I have to do another one for Voyer and then I start I did another version of funny enough and that's probably the one I'll end up doing. I did another version of track one with a, with a guy here named Troy Denari, and he actually put a vocal on it. So what I'll end up doing is that will probably be my stem for track one for the stems. So then it'll have a vocal on it. You could take the vocal out or put the vocal back in. So I do want to take some questions from the audience, but one final question for you so you guys can think about uh, what you'd like to ask Kerry Chandler. Um, someone you admire on the scene today you know, outside of your core group of friends and everything, and it could be it could be a scientist, <laughs> it oh, could be a NASA, NASA oh. engineer, it could be Raymond Kurzweil. I don't know, oh. but is there someone? Maybe we should make it about music, but <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, but tell us who who you really admire and why. Nikola Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. Nikola Tesla. And um, this is funny because I said for my birthday I'm gonna and I'm, I gotta go back and do this. I didn't know this either. That. I mean, I know he he used to live at the New Yorker before he passed away, but I didn't realize the New Yorker actually, you can rent his room out still. You can just go to New, the New Yorker and go, oh, this is the Nikola Tesla where, you know, part where he worked, and you can actually go to where he 
live and rent a room and just, you know, so I thought, well, damn, it's genius of everything. I, I loved so much wireless and all, all the lights that we even have on now, all the power and everything that's going on. The, the cell phone in my pocket, everything is Tesla. I mean, everybody would think that it would be like, oh, it's Edison. So Tesla is the reason anything is wireless, first of all. Tesla is alternating currents. And, and that's, to me, that's half of it, you know. And why, why didn't he really get the, the credit? You know, why is he kind of considered the uh, the underdog, you know, like compared to an Edison or something like well, that? I think it was just history and time. He wanted he wanted free everything. He wanted everyone to have free energy. And that doesn't work <laughs> for the for the big wigs who didn't like that. Because at the time, I think it was um, somebody was bankrolling his stuff. I'm trying to remember who. I want to say it was Rockefeller. Was was you know if you can't make money off of something, he was about to to you know he made a plan for free energy where there was a so crazy and I think this is where I got my honest ionosphere EP from. He wanted to send a satellite into the ionosphere and have a position like the pole. You've probably seen this thing before, like the um, the, the, the Sparky pole thing. I can't remember what it's called now, <laughs> but um, Tesla coil. The Tesla coil, yeah, and um. He wanted to send a signal, and it's like one hertz that ran back because the energy gives off, you know, energy, the, the, the core of the Earth. He wanted to send a signal pulse that would send the satellite back down to the core, and everyone could actually just use it for free. This thing would go around every month and cycle back, and we'd have free renewable energy. Nobody, yeah, just feeding it back from the ionosphere because it, it creates this cycle loop. All right, so you guys have a few uh, homework assignments, all right? <laughs> Research Nikola Tesla. Um, listen to the Atmosphere EP track one is another one. Um, <laughs> tune your home sound systems. <laughs> oh, RTAs, yeah. Y using the, uh, the app, right? Yeah, the RTA, real-time alignment. Real-time app, RTA app, all right? <laughs> um, also, uh, the track that you dedicated um, to your daughter. Oh, yeah, for my daughter. Yeah. And it's on large, actually. Okay. It's on large records? Yeah. All right. So actually, I should put it on. My, I think I'm going to just put it on my Facebook. So if anyone wants to hear it, I'll just. <laughs> there it is. I'll do that tonight. All right. So those are some of your homework assignments. <laughs> and um, I'll be the roaming microphone if anyone has any questions. Does anyone uh, want to ask anything? Carrie Chandler? Nothing? Nothing? All right. It's funny because I have a lot of my friends in the audience. <laughs> 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 they only want to ask. You already know me. Don't so. be shy. Um, all right. Well, let me. Let me Sort of wind it down with uh, asking what's on your schedule, what's your calendar, are you touring avidly? Yeah, well, I mean, well, tonight even, I'm, I'm going to do um, the Circle Local Party, which is like 4 o'clock in the morning with Black Coffee. And then after that is the Art Department Party, which is the after party for that. Are, are those, are those uh, folks that you feel, you know, a connection to musically? Oh, completely. Yeah, like yeah like I mean... Black Coffee and, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the thing is, it's like a... All the DJs I know and all the all the DJs I, I meet on the road, they're they're honestly like family to me. Like I mean, I, I can go and, ah, ah, I can point to all my friends that I've known forever, out here just in, in the audience and Gav and stuff. You know, it's like my boy from like you know Ireland and there's my man. I mean, I can just it's it's just fun for me and it's just like these are people I break bread with. And besides the music, these are my friends. Be, uh, be, if I did know music anymore, these are still my friends. Yeah. Do you see? Um at a point at which you won't be touring. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it's inevitable. I don't want to die on the road. That's the word. <laughs> no, I don't want... That's the, that's the last thing. I want to go out with, with, with a happy thought. I want people to go... When they, they think of me, I want them to just go, Carrie, yeah, Carrie. I don't want them to go, oh, Carrie. <laughs> 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 you know, so that that's the best way, I think. Cool, man. Well, we appreciate you, man. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for all the music over the years and just your whole approach and your vibe. And, and you know, anytime I've seen you uh, play live, I, I feel so much joy from you just in... Oh, ha I'm, I'm happy to be there. You can't get rid of me. I mean, you <laughs> feel it in the booth. You can just yeah. see that you, you love what you do. So, um, so thank you. Carrie Chandler, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.